One of the most rewarding aspects and privileges our staff has is to help people understand the Kennedy assassination events by making full use of our collections, oral histories, exhibits, and public programs. Tonight's program, Remembering Officer J.E. Tibbet, would not have been possible without the support of the Dallas Police Museum and its curator, Senior Corporal Rick Janish. Rick, would you stand, please? Thank you, sir. Other members of the Dallas Police Department have also assisted, and one in particular has long been supportive of our guests. Please welcome the head of the Dallas Police Department, Chief David Brown. Thank you so much to the Sixth Floor Museum for this honor to be present here for this commemorative event. And first to the Tippett family, Marie, and all the family members and friends who have been supportive over these many, many years. I want to thank you all for being here today. You know, one of the mantras we have each Memorial Day when we serve uh, our police officers for the police memorial is that we'll never forget. And thank you so much to the Sixth Floor Museum for honoring that mantra that we have amongst ourselves in law enforcement. The Tippy family has given so much. They've sacrificed so much. But what I loved about today is we have this opportunity to show the Tippy family how much we care. And I really appreciate this opportunity and we have a, a special thing we're gonna do for you, Ms. Tippett that you've been asking for for many, many years. We created a commemorative badge, a J.D. Tippett commemorative badge, and I'm presenting this to Ms. Tippett. She's been on us about getting this to him. We've been waiting for the right occasion, and I got a smile out of her, so we're doing good. <laughs> Ms. Tippett, if you don't mind coming forward so we can present this commemorative J.D. Tippett badge to you. Thank you again. I wish you could see that smile. <laughs> <laughs> For five decades now, Officer J.D. Tippett's widow has remained loyal to the police department while maintaining a, a low public profile, at least until tonight. <laughs> but in recent years, she's come to accept that she is important to all members of law enforcement and especially for those who gave their lives to keep the rest of us safe. We are truly honored to have Mrs. Marie Tippett as our guest tonight, along with the Tippett children, Brenda and Curtis, and several Tippett relatives and friends are here tonight as well, including JD's sister, Joyce. Folks, would you stand and turn around and face the family? Thank you so much for being here, all of you. Finally, we are extremely grateful to Hugh Ainsworth for serving as our program moderator. Hugh is a longtime personal and professional colleague whose attachment and connection to the complex events of Friday, November 22, 1963 is unparalleled. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Hugh Ainsworth, and our guests, the Tippett family, Marie, Brenda, and Curtis. Thank you. And now we're about to see a uh, whole movie, correct? Here it comes.
And next, we're going to see a Channel 8 report, I think, one year after the assassination. And uh, Ron Ryland, who was at the Tippett scene within minutes, is giving a report. This is the Texas Theater one year later. This was the beginning of the end for Lee Harvey Oswald. For me, the beginning was at the Texas Book Depository. First thing I knew about the assassination when came across police radio that shots had been fired. Instinctively, I raced for the Texas Book Depository, ran into the building with Secret Service agents. When one of the men raced up to us and said there's been a shooting of an officer in Oak Cliff, we raced out of the building, jumped into our unit that was parked at the curb. We went to 10th Street here in Oak Cliff. An officer had been shot. The crime lab was here investigating officers, witnesses. And this was the first that we knew that the officer was J.D. Tippett. Another person ran up to us at this point and said he has run into an old building down the street, a building that was used to house antiques. Officer Hill and several others ran into the front of the building with drawn pistols. I ran around the back of the building with my camera in hopes that if they flushed this man that we were looking for, he would come out the back door right into the face of the camera. At this point, we found a gray jacket that once again this unknown man had abandoned. At this point, we once again jumped into our units following a whole group of police cars that went racing over towards Jefferson Avenue to a public library. At the library, once again, our police radios said that the man that we were seeking had run into the Texas Theater. We dashed down to the Texas Theater, ran into the building, we raced down to the first floor of the theater. There was a man sitting about three rows from the back of the theater. He jumped up and shouted, this is it. Officer Hill, McDonald, others jumped him and quickly manacled the man and hustled him out through these doors to a squad car that was waiting at the curb. This was the first time that anyone had even mentioned that this man was possibly tied in with the assassination. The crowd standing around in front hollered, kill him, hang this man. They hustled him away, turning the corner for City Hall. Marie, I don't think any of us can understand or, or really know what went through your mind that day. When did you actually hear about him being shot? Well, uh, Jenny's sister, jo uh, uh, Joyce, is here tonight, and their older sister could not be here, but Chris called me and told me that they had heard it on the radio, the television, and love it. And I needed to, to check in with the police station. And so I did, and I was told that he was, uh, was killed. I can't imagine feelings and three small children. You must, on this day, which would have been his 90th birthday, you still feel it. Yes, most definitely. And you do too. Yes, most definitely. But one thing I need to say at the beginning here, on that day, on that weekend, there were many mistakes made by honest people, but for instance, uh, Governor Connolly and Ralph Yarborough, the senator, were arguing on who they should ride with. J. Edgar Hoover is telling LBJ that the Heidel name that he used was really his girlfriend. District Attorney Henry Wade swore to the press that a cab driver named Daryl Click had taken him Oswald Oak Cliff. And at least two county deputies watched as Oswald's rifle was found and told the press it was a Mauser. So all of them were trying, but so many failed to do their jobs that day, but J.D. Tippett did not. Had he not, had he not intercepted Oswald at that time, who among us can imagine how many more people might have been killed? I mean, it's, he, he was, nobody knew he was in Oak Cliff at that time. Cab driver didn't tell anyone for hours. So I, I just think we ought to understand that Tippett was doing his job 
when many, many others did not quite measure up during that time. Let's go back to where you were born in Clarksville, Texas, right? I was, in Red River County. And uh, was J.D. there too? Uh, J.D. was born in Anna, Texas, and uh, then the family moved uh, to in the Clarksville area. One time we lived pretty close to each other, didn't we? And he uh, he was ahead of you four years. Correct. That's cool. And then he joined the Army. Right. Became a paratrooper. And when he came back, how did you all get together? Well, you know, then there wasn't a lot of things to do like the young people do now. So you went down <laughs> to the floor, and you walked around the square. Uh -huh. And you talked to everybody you met as well along. So I was down there that day with my mother, and she was seen I was bored. And she said, well, why don't you go greet the Jetty and Tippett? He, I see he's home. And we were having a revival that night at church. And I said, okay. So I went over and told him about the revival and invited him to come. And he showed up that night. Huh. So that started a romance that ended up in a marriage a few months later. In December? Yes. Of that year? Uh, yes, of December uh, <clears throat> the 26th. Well, I hadn't met you all before, your children. Uh, tell me how this affected your life and what you recall of your dad, Linda. Well, I remember pulling myself into a shell and just sort of keeping my grief inside for a long time. Um, Crying in the bathtub, um, ride my bike up and down the street. And Curtis, you were only five. Was I was um, <clears throat> four, about to be five. Yeah, so I, I have uh, some memories, but not many as far as that goes. Um, you know, I, I but you did ride with him in, his, in the car occasionally. Yes, I uh, go, going oh, to the so store, I'm stuff like that. The store. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have little memories of. Uh, uh, going with him up to the hardware store, and uh, I think there was the uh, had an old fifty-something Chevrolet where the, the floor was rusted out in the back. I remember dropping little things down in the holes, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, coming back and uh, towards the, in, in the neighborhood and seeing if I could tell him how to get back home, and uh, you know uh, stuff like that. Uh, I remember it's so funny that. Uh, but at, before he died, we were, I was doing some coloring book, and, and uh, I asked him to color one. And he colored uh, this frog and whatever, and of course it looked real good, not nothing like mine. And uh, I remember looking and looking for that coloring book after he died, and I never could find it. But anyway, I just... Uh, what well, memories do you have? Well, you know what? He, may I say something? Sure. Uh, he told me he had to get home every time he went to the store from then on. See, the... <laughs> He was the one that was home, and Brenda was at school, so he was the one that went with his dad when he went places. Uh -huh. And if he went to the store to pick up something, he carried him along. Brenda, what are some of your memories? Uh, I remember he was always laughing, always smiling, uh, dancing. Uh, I remember dancing, standing on his feet and, uh, to Nat King Cole, yeah. and uh, had a wonderful sense of humor. And, I would always, uh, always laugh around him, and uh, there was a pet spider up in the corner. He named Elmer, and just anything to make his kids laugh. And uh, he was a, a great father. He was always um, wanted us, wanted to be with us. Yeah, we we always felt loved. We definitely felt loved. So. Did you have any difficulties in school because you? father was so famous, it did, and kids can be cruel. Did you have any instances at school that upset you? I think I blacked out the rest of the school year, so I don't remember. I think it was just a blur. I think I failed that year. <laughs> <laughs> and how, you were about 10 then? Or I was 10. Yeah. Well, Marie, I wonder uh, something here. Uh, over the years, we've seen so much controversy about what really happened here and nowhere in Oak Cliff. 
and there have been more than 200 conspiracy theories, as I'm sure you're aware. No. <laughs> I'm aware of that. <laughs> good for, I, I could, good I could, for you. <laughs> I could have told you if they'd asked me. <laughs> what do you feel about what do you feel about conspiracy and what do you what do you think that uh, who is there someone else involved in all this? Well I think the conspiracy people just wanted publicity. That's all they wanted. It does mean money, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Filthy lucre. <laughs> But don't you get a little angry sometimes? I've seen people being very critical of you, Trent. Remember one time they they sort of made fun of you because you didn't have a new couch. Remember <laughs> that? And I thought, my God, you know, this is reporting. <laughs> but you you take all this and you're pretty pretty good with it. How do you do that? Well, you pray for that person that's giving you the criticism. He's got a problem. How would you all... <laughs> how would you two like the world to remember your dad? I'm sure you hadn't thought about it in a few hours, but... <laughs> well, I'd like to remember for him to be remembered. He, you know, he was a, a regular person, um, you know, that loved his family. He was a, a very good policeman. I remember, uh, talked with his friends and seeing how that, you know, he noticed things, uh, all the time. Uh, and, you know, whether it was, uh, windows broke or different things that looked suspicious. And, and I'm sure that's what led to, uh, uh, noticing Oswald and the way he kind of looked when he saw him driving up. But, you know, I'm wanting to re be remembered that he, he loved his family. Uh, he loved being a policeman and, uh, you know, so not many people get to love their job. And uh, getting to be a policeman, you see every, new people constantly, new situations. And uh, he loved his job. That's one thing Mom always said. He loved his job. And, uh, you know, so he, he, he died doing what he loved. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, being a, a Christian family, I want people to remember that he, he did uh, take his faith seriously, you know. And uh, so that's some of the major things I, I think about it. You know, the, uh, uh, we really were, were a close family. Uh, I mean, uh, the Tibbet family, I've always been amazed how, you know, the brothers and sisters always done things together constantly and how many uh, families that the brothers and sisters never want to see each other and all this stuff, you know. So it was a really a, a been remembered as a, a family man that loved his family. Brenda, do you add your I, thoughts? Yeah, he definitely loved his family. We spent time together. We would go to Aunt Chris's, and that was their entertainment. We was with family, and we all loved each other. And But that must have been a little tough, because he sometimes had two jobs. It, yeah, it was very tough. So he, it was his job and his family. <clears throat> but when he got off work, when he got off work, we and he'd have to get ready because we were going to East Texas to see his dad, and uh, I needed to have the kids ready so we'd get there as quickly as possible. And the brothers would come over and they'd go fishing together. He left to go fishing and and talk football and play football, and uh, so Joyce was here tonight and and the. The twin, the girls over there, Denise twins. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was with them so much, and uh, it was a, it's just been a pleasure to be part of the Tippett family because they, like Chris was saying, they were a loving family. And if he was alive today, you know what he'd be doing besides having a date nice green? Going fishing with one of those boys. <laughs> well, I think, too, uh, we haven't talked about this, but your faith, your family's faith, has carried you heavily in through this, has it not? Yes. We well, see how people get better when they lose their loved ones without the dependency on the Lord. Uh, the oldest boy died May the 22nd of this year with lung cancer. I sure wouldn't have made it through that one either had it not been for my faith in the Lord. 
and for the help that all the family and friends gave me. You had a lot of friends you always have had, the whole family has. And I want to tell you about one friend of the years that I met the night your husband died. Uh, his name is Bill Anglin, and I just met his lovely wife here earlier. And uh, the Dallas News sent me on a mission to go do a story about your family that night, the night that he was killed. It's the worst thing that a reporter can get in an assignment. You don't want to do it. You don't want to bother. It's horrible. So I go out to your house, and there's a Glen Cairn, and I swore I wasn't going to try to get in. But I met Bill Anglin on the porch, and he and a couple other people were there, and he sat down and talked with me and filled in and so I could go on my way. But he was a fine fellow, and I saw him a couple times afterward. I just wonder what, it's so strange, had he not stopped Oswald there, I wonder where Oswald would have gone. You ever think about that? I'm not sure, but I think he had him a route plan to, to leave, and he would have gotten away if he hadn't killed Jetty. He would have, indeed. That, that, that was his, the reason he didn't get away. And he was doing his job because this, the bulletin described Oswald almost perfect. Maybe he missed five or ten pounds, but it really, no. He had reason to stop it. And uh, some of the people that, that saw what went on, they were amazed because everything happened so fast. And then Oswald runs, runs away to the theater. It was, a, it was a weird day for many people. Tell me more about your faith. What what? You were very religious even then. Yes. Yeah. And you have been since. Yes. Yeah. We're going to take a few questions from the audience if you'll fill in a couple of a couple of sheets that you have out there. <clears throat> I'm going to start off here. Kyle asks, do you feel frustrations and insulted when you hear your husband's name brought up as a possible co-conspirator. Well, to me, that's the most ridiculous thing ever was. You know, he was not a co-conspirator. Uh, he didn't didn't have time to be co-conspirator. <laughs> right. <laughs> but tell him what he was doing the night before, Amal. And then Did tell him. Tell, tell everybody what he was doing the night before the night he was before a conspirator. He was killed, <laughs> uh, Pansy and I went to the preschool PTA, which I was very involved in, and Jay took care of these kids, and Bill and Jay put brakes on our car that evening, and they got through about dark, and Pansy and I were gone to the to the preschool PTA. When I got home, the dishes were washed. Uh, Jody seen that they got the dishes washed, and uh, everybody was in bed. But him, he was waiting up for me. So, no, he, he wasn't out there work doing nothing. He was supposed to be doing. Here's another. Did you uh, remain close friends with Carl Mather and his wife after your husband's death? Did you ever feel that they were connected in some way with the death of your husband or President Kennedy? No, they were neighbors that lived down the street and we seen each other and then they moved away. They moved to, uh, to McKinney, I think it was, that they moved away. So, no, they weren't involved anyway. I don't know where that came from because I've heard the names of at least 130 people involved. I never heard their name accused of anything. Uh, let's see. What is the first thing that crossed your mind when you think of your husband 50 years later? 
the first thing that crosses my mind 50 years later how blue his eyes were how wonderful it was to just see him walk through that door and grab me and hug me and then I start crying because he's not there anymore So he asked me to be honest. And he's not there anymore. He can't come and give me a hug. He can't encourage me. But he really taught me a lot of things. When we got married, I was one of these straight laced girls that, man, if you're supposed to do something, you better do it. And if you deviated, there was no shades of right. And when I would get upset about something on that order he would quickly remind me that i had walked i had walked in their shoes for a while and i needed to be able to do that before i could say anything about it so Makes sense. <laughs> i've always remembered that one <laughs> do you remember that within days you got a very compelling very wonderful letter from a lady i think in japan you remember that? Oh, yes. T tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I was just so uh, amazed, amazed. It's such a beautiful letter to begin with. It was just absolutely beautiful. And the wording, it was written on silk. Hmm. And the words on it was just so heartwarming. And, and it made you want to sit and read it again because it gave you courage and encouragement. And to totally know, unexpected. Uh, yes, he was a lady in Japan, and it proved to me that people in a foreign country can really care about other people. And the Japanese people did. I got a, a geisha doll that's really pretty. Uh, they sent me the the class in northern Japan sent me a thousand paper cranes that I've hung in my house and then there was another group of children that sent me a crane paper cranes that were red white and blue cranes and uh, the letters were so encouraging but this particular one it really stood out in my mind and I remembered it I kept it in my drawer and for all these years and I got it out and it was getting really ugly because it was deteriorating. So I asked Corporal Tennant, would he help me find a way to preserve the letter? It means so much to me. I didn't want it to deteriorate further. So the thing that the people in Japan remembered a patrolman that was killed when Kennedy did. And she cared enough to sit down and write a letter to the widow, that was really a astounding thing. It was just amazing. Hey, I uh, just got a note here, and I honest to goodness, I'm going to ask this question next. <laughs> you got another letter from a very famous person that must have been very touching to you, too. Can oh, you tell us Jacqueline about that? Jacqueline Kennedy? Yes. Oh, yes. Why were Jacqueline Kennedy that was suffering so much with the loss of her husband and the president of the united states pay attention and cared but maybe i began to realize as time went on that we shared and she told me that we shared such a bond at I mean, telling our children all their lives what brave me and their husband their that their fathers were but we had a bond nobody else could understand because my husband was killed uh, apprehending the killer of, of her husband and we did share a bond but getting that letter was really heartwarming and amazing and i felt she was such a gracious lady and she cared so much and it really was wonderful. 
Was J.D. Uh, a backer of President Kennedy? Did he take part well, politically in any way? Well, we voted for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Is a question, what troubles you, if anything, about the Warren Commission report? I don't know. Was J.D. sociable with his fellow officers? Did he get with them a lot? I know he did with two or three of them. He's well, back then, the officers had, they had picnics and uh, things like that for the officers. And we'd all go to that, and everybody would have a good time. And uh, J.D. was a fun-loving guy, wasn't he, Joyce? He was a fun-loving guy. He liked to to be with all the other uh, officers, and, you know, we'd get together and make ice cream, you know, to turn the crank. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. He was proud to be a cop, wasn't he? <laughs> uh, he felt that he was doing some good. That was his real... Feeling. I think that he thought he was doing some good. I know that one time he came home telling me about this young man that he felt that he had to tear the boy from being, getting drunk all the time because of his influence. And uh, he thought that he was doing some good as an officer. Yeah, this is a tricky one here now. Were you able to forgive Lee Harvey Oswald for taking his life? Well, you know, I just didn't think about that for years. I, I, I didn't, uh, nothing was going to burn J.D. Peck. And yeah, uh, why, why would you get bitter and angry and, and all that kind of stuff when it wasn't going to burn J.D. back? And so, yes, I guess you'd have to say I'll forgive him. He was a poor misguided his soul, wasn't he? Was the tremendous outpouring of love and support from the world of any solace during those early days? Yes, and it still was, it still is. Because I got letters, I got mail from all over the world. And that people that would uh, write me a letter in a foreign country, think about that. We're so busy here and how many people do y'all think about writing to somebody here, much less overseas? And and I got so many letters from all kinds, all different countries that people cared. And that was very comforting to know that other people really cared and that my husband had got killed. Did J.D. work one time, part-time at Texas Theater? heard that but I wasn't sure. I don't remember him ever working in Texas theater. Uh, he was working at a theater uh, over on Fort Worth Avenue. Can't remember the name of it. I guess that's important but he worked at Austin Barbecue. Yes. Another one about Carl Mather. How did you know him? What did he say to you at your home that afternoon? Why do you think Carl's car was parked garage on 7th Street. You yeah. pretty much answered that. He I lived down the block. I have no idea, but he didn't live down the block. Uh, it, when Jody died, they lived over uh, on Glenfield, and we lived on Glen Heron, so we didn't live next to him at that time. We had as been neighbors at, at one time. Why did you tell the Saturday Evening Post that you were feeling very blue when J.D. left home after lunch, and why were you feeling uneasy? Recall? I don't know why I was feeling uneasy, but uh, I, I did, really did. I just felt like something terrible was going to happen. I didn't know what, so I was babysitting a little boy, and I immediately got involved in getting his lunch, and. Uh, getting the dishes washed and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, you just don't want to stop and think that 
you need to say a prayer for them when they leave, and you just don't want to stop and think that something could happen to them. <laughs> well, um, um, he came home for lunch that day, and then got the phone call um, at the house what had happened. Isn't that correct? That's right. So you knew whenever he drove off that the president had been killed and that they had called him uh, to, to go patrol. Well, he, right? had to, he knew the president was in town and he had to rush back to work. Yes, that's true. Because he came by. That was a, a miracle I got to see him because he didn't usually come home for lunch. So the Lord just blessed me. I just got a special blessing. Percy was home that day. Brother was in school. Um, Alan had uh, gotten sick at school and I went and got him and I was glad that I did because uh, he was hurt on the, on the school you know at school and yeah I was the police told me that uh, he was killed which was not a, a practice of the, of the police at all because they always come and got the, the woman and and carried it to the hospital or something. But life, man, everything was so upside down that day that, you know, there was just, nothing was working the way it always did. Curtis, have you told your uh, children about your grandfather's place in history? Um, yes. Um, you know, I guess to say that uh, just growing up, um, I never did really set everybody down and talk to them or it's kind of like just um, I guess to say they just found out as they got older uh, a lot um, I guess they're you know looking back I'm trying to understand the why and everything and um, maybe because of all the attention that, that everything had gone through in the family and stuff like that and uh, you know we had a bunch of kids but we were all we homeschooled and so they didn't get as much exposure so to speak and uh so therefore i didn't have to uh face a lot of that at the at that time and uh but they've been very proud of uh my father and what all he's done and they enjoy going to uh, uh the memorial uh, every year uh, downtown uh, that's, that's done in, uh, and um uh, so anyway they are um, proud of him and everything that's been done. But Can you add to that? Have you told everyone, your family and friends and all, mm. how important your dad was? There were, because of a lot of publicity, sometimes I wouldn't speak out as much. Um, I would be working and say my name and people would ask me, you know, was I the daughter of the officer? And, uh, you hear it so much that sometimes you um, didn't want the attention always. Sometimes you just wanted to, to be Brenda, you know? Right. Blamed in the yeah. woodwork. <laughs> yeah, but I was very proud of my father and and what, what he stands for for history. Are all three of you, my reply here, are you surprised at the intensity and the interest 50 years later? I am, mm -hmm. um, seriously, but uh, I know that, uh, you know, the being the president getting killed and everybody wanting to make conspiracy thoughts and on and on, I guess to say that, you know, a lot of people, I just never uh, would have thought that to how much they know more about it than I have ever did. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were doing so much research, read so many books, and so I, I realized that they're, uh, I'm very surprised that a lot of people have really kept the, uh, up the interest and, you know, but um, every time I, I think of anything like us getting together here or other places that mention him uh, on the anniversary, you know, I just, I think of it a whole lot is that it's just a, a reminder to everybody, uh, you know, the, the risk and the dangers involved that policemen face every day. And uh, that's what it, it really says to me when I see his picture on TV <laughs> around the 22nd or something like that, because, uh, you know, we just don't really think uh, it could be, you know, anybody else's brother there on the police force or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I also want to say that it's been four months since my older brother passed away, and I know he was deeply affected. Um, 
by losing her father. He was 13, and uh, I don't think he ever really came to grips with um, a lot of, a lot of that he should have in life. And uh, I know when he died, he had a lot of regrets uh, for things that he had hadn't done and had done. Um, and I wish he could be with us today. So do you have any resentment towards Dallas police or the chief for the shooting of Oswald by Ruby? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any resentment toward anybody. <laughs> Well, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? Have you been pleased by opening up with the friends here tonight? Yes, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, and uh, I am amazed that, and thank you all everybody for coming. And, you know, um, uh, it is um, such an honor to, to get to um, talk about my father and be here with uh, my mom and sister. And, um, you know, I just... Uh, um, you know, I just think so much how that it could have been just any other guy out there. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, uh, in just an instant, how a life and many people's lives are just changed forever. I mean, uh, so, uh, uh, I guess to say that, you know, uh, true, we should all live our life to the fullest and uh, at all times because you just never know in just a, a little bit how just everything changes forever. You add anything? Well, it means so much to me that these people have come out tonight because I feel they care. If they didn't care, they wouldn't have went to the effort and to come. And I really appreciate each one of you coming. Thank you very much. I, I guess that Jay meant so much to me that I'm, I'm thankful that somebody else wanted to know about him. He was just an ordinary policeman out there doing his job like all the other guys are doing today and so many of them. we got too many on that world down there, so please pray a prayer, say a prayer that next year we won't have another one that uh, will go through not having someone else killed this year. Curtis, did you ever think about becoming a cop? Um, you know, it's kind of funny, uh, no, <laughs> I, I say that because I was around police all the time, uh, my uncles were policemen for 30 something years and, uh, but it's so funny, I don't know why I didn't, uh, but, uh, uh I, I thought about that too, let you. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just, I grew up and it's like, uh, it just didn't soak in. And uh, and everything, but I'm too nice. I don't know if I could have done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let these fine family and their friends know how much we appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you.